I'm back. Thank you, Dr. Grove, for the blessing of your presentation. And man, that's great. Everyone should know we can tell our story um, and you can win someone to Jesus with that three minutes of opportunity to share your story. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. David Hartman. I'm looking forward to his presentation. Uh, he teaches at the School of Religion at Southern Adventist University. He teaches cor courses such as Christian witnessing, personal evangelism, evangelistic preaching, Christian beliefs, Christian spirituality, and church ministry. Prior to coming to Southern, he spent 24 years in pastoral ministry, and then after that he spent nine years as the ministerial director and evangelism coordinator for the Kentucky-Tennessee Conference. David is married to Judy. They have two grown children and three grandchildren. And David enjoys camping, hiking, and traveling. He has a passion to share Jesus with others and to train others to do the same. He has also written a book that I hope he's going to share with you. We'll mention it later, and uh, we're going to recommend that as a great resource. And David, we're looking forward to what you have to share. We give you the time, and we'll save a little time for questions and answers at the end. So as you're listening, and you, if you have a question, please uh, just jot it down, and then you can chat it, uh, type it in, and we'll try to get to it later in the presentation. I'm going to invite you to pray with me as we welcome Dr. Hartman to the screen. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to gain practical instruction from Dr. David Hartman. We pray that you'll bless our time together now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this training. And I have learned a great deal myself just listening to the testimonies of Nathan and Tom. It's been powerful. Some of what I'm going to share with you is going to be a repeat, but it will be in a little different uh, wording and so forth. I want to talk to you about how to tell your story, and all of us have a story. I am trying to advance my slides here, and it is not wanting to advance. So, can tech people help me? Let's see. Yeah, I am unable to share my slides. Go ahead and uh, uh, restart your slides. Okay, I'm going to stop share and then start again. That's correct. Okay. Too. There we go. Okay, are you able to advance them now? Okay, that's not doing it. Is it in slide mode? Presentation? Uh, let's see. Let's find out. That might help, wouldn't it? Just a second. Uh, the way this appears on my screen, I don't have the normal tab where I can hit slide mode. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. There's a little tab here that I can use and I think we'll be okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. So what is a testimony? I would like to define testimony as simply relaying from one's own personal experience the things that God has done. Like has already been said, we're not, we're not, is that coming is that through coming fine, through gentlemen? gentlemen? Like has already been said, 
your primary role is not to share the doctrines, the Sabbath, state of the dead. It's just relaying from your own experience what God has done. You may not be an expert at the doctrines, but you are an expert at one thing. And that is what Jesus has done in your life. What is an eyewitness in court? Eyewitness simply swears to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. They don't say, your honor, I saw in the evening news such and such happened, this accident. They said, I was at Udawa Georgetown Road and Apison Pike at 6 p.m. on this particular date and a Chevy Suburban came through the red light and plowed in and T-boned this other vehicle. You simply tell what Jesus has done. Here's what 1 John chapter 1 says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. This we declare to you. All of us can declare our story. One of the most powerful stories in the Bible, one of the most powerful examples, it's already been mentioned about the Apostle Paul, was the demoniac. You find that in Luke chapter eight. What do we know about the demoniac? It says he lived among the tombs. He actually on the east side of the Jordan, there were sandstone caves where they buried their dead. He lived among the cadavers. We know that he had superhuman strength. He was often jailed because of his crimes and he would yank the chains right out of the concrete walls. Because he was possessed, the Bible says in verse 30, there was a legion of demons in him. Do you know that a legion in the Roman army was 6,000 soldiers? He possibly had 6,000 soldiers, excuse me, demons that were possessing him. But when he met Jesus, Jesus with one power, powerful word of authority, dispelled those demons, and he became a new man. He was sitting, he was clothed, he was in his right mind. And immediately the text tells us in Luke, I'm gonna turn there, Luke chapter eight. If you have your Bibles, you can turn along. Luke chapter eight, it says in verse 38, he begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus, said to him, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. I maintain, guys, ladies, God has done great things for you, has he not? You can tell what you know of the faithfulness of God. And I can imagine this guy going back home to tell his family what Jesus had done. In my imagination, I see little Johnny playing with his Tonka trucks out in the sandbox. And when he sees daddy, his eyes are large with fright. He runs into the house and screams, mama, mama, daddy's home. Daddy was rarely home, but when he was, he would kick and scream and abuse. They locked the door, push furniture up against it. And I can just imagine their hearts are pounding. And then there's this quiet knock. Johnny, Mary, it's Daddy, don't be afraid because I'm a changed man. You see, I have met this man named Jesus. Wow, the power of telling our story. Do you know that because of the testimony of that one man, verse 40 tells us that Jesus later, 10 months later, came back to that same region of Decapolis, the region of the 10 cities, and there were thousands ready to meet him because of the testimony of one changed life. Here's what Desire of Ages, page 347 says. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old. That means we can tell 
of the biblical record and the Bible stories, but that which will be most effectual is the testimony of what? What does it say, ladies and gentlemen? The testimony of our own experience. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like light, have what kind of power? Irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. So I want to talk about three types of testimonies that you can share. All of us can share all three of these types. And Tom has talked about the first one, the conversion testimony. Then there is secondly, the daily testimony, what Jesus is doing daily in our life. You don't just refer back to 30 years ago when he came into your life as your personal savior. You can refer to God's daily faithfulness in your life. And then finally, the living testimony, which without a word, just by the conduct of your life. Let's go back and look at those three. First of all, we can share our conversion testimony. This is how we met Jesus as our personal savior. And for all of us, this will be vastly different as you saw from Tom and Nathan's testimony. The conversion story consists of three parts, as has already been referenced. Before I met Jesus, what was my life like? When I met Jesus, what were the circumstances of that encounter? And then finally, the third part, since I met Jesus. Paul's testimony is classic. If you look at Acts chapter 26, there is a clear, distinct before and when he was on the road to Damascus and got knocked off his horse by that blinding light, and then the dramatic change that Jesus made in his life. Here are a few additional guidelines for sharing your testimony. Emphasize Jesus, not the Adventist church or the truth or the Sabbath. There's a place for how you discovered the beauty of the Sabbath, the beauty of the truth that the Adventist church has but primarily your story is about how you came to know Jesus as your personal savior. Secondly, use simple language. Use language that the average person can understand. Try to stay away from Adventist Christian cliches. Be positive, never self-righteous or condemning. Don't say I used to be one of those uh, Sunday keeping Baptists or one of those uh, Mark of the Beast Roman Catholic, and I found the light, I found the truth. <laughs> we don't want to be demeaning of other denominations because possibly that person will have that background and we don't want to be an offense to them. Next, be specific. Be specific, be real, be transparent, not generalities, vague generalities. Another one is don't dwell on the before. Let me share what happened when I was at Southern Adventist University about 45 years ago. I came on campus as a freshman. Chattanooga First Church hosted a Friday evening Vespers, or maybe it was a Saturday evening Vespers, I don't recall. And there was a guy that used to be a Hell's Angel motorcycle rider. He was into a life of drugs and crime and sex and gore. And he came and shared his story in about an hour, hour and a half. And I remember the vivid details of his life before Jesus. Then he shared about how he met Jesus. It was quite brief. And then very brief about his life, what his life was like since he met Jesus. What do you think? I dwelt on <laughs> as a university student as I left the program that night. I thought about all the blood and sex and gore and drugs and all those crimes, and I frankly had nightmares. We need to tell enough about our previous life to give context to the change that Jesus has made, but don't dwell there. Don't dwell in the muck. 
use the before to show the context, but quickly get to the when and the since. Also, be prepared to lead your contact to Jesus. Ask if they've thought, if they've thought about telling their story or if they're not a Christian, would you like to know, have the assurance of eternal life? I wanna share a couple quick testimonies. Dwight Nelson has been for many years, uh, almost 40 years, about 38 years, pastor of Pioneer Memorial Church. When I was in the seminary, I will never forget the summer of 1983 when Dwight shared his testimony. He shared growing up as a little kid in Japan, his parents were missionaries. And one day he was down by the lake on a little dock and he accidentally fell in. No other adults were around. Fortunately, across the lake in a little rowboat was Glenn and June Bowen. And they saw the incident that happened. They quickly rowed over to this little guy that was head down in the water. They grabbed him by the nape of the neck and pulled him to safety. A brand plucked from the burning, so to speak. After Dwight told his story, he said, would you like to meet my earthly savior? And then off to the side of the platform, through a door, walked Glenn and June Bowen. This is my earthly savior, the couple that pulled me out of the water when I was age three, and he gave them a large spray of flowers. Then Dwight proceeded to say, now, You've met my earthly savior. Would you like to meet my heavenly savior? And he told about how he had grown up in the church and he was studying theology. And he met Jesus by reading a little book called Steps to Christ. He came to a clear understanding. My testimony is somewhat similar to Tom's. I grew up in a wonderful Christian home. My dad was an Adventist pastor. And from my earliest recollection, my greatest desire was to go home and be with Jesus one day. So when I got to high school, I walked a pretty straight line. I had some classmates that were into drugs and drinking and so forth. And I just politely declined, no, I don't wanna go there. When I got to college, my walk with Jesus intensified. You see, I had an understanding that in order to get to heaven, I had to be absolutely 100% sinlessly perfect. And so I set out with a vengeance to get rid of all the vices, the habits in my life that were negative and hurtful. And I tried to acquire all the habits that would help me to get to heaven. I remember my roommate was a brand new Christian. His name was Judd and he would get up in the morning and read his Bible and pray and it was so meaningful. Tears would come down his face and I was jealous. I didn't have that kind of experience. And I began to get resentful because I've been at this for years. I should have that kind of peace, but I didn't. I tried to pray. I tried to read my Bible as a meritorious checklist uh an act of performance to get good enough for heaven and i was still just as empty one day after going through the motions after trying like being on a treadmill treadmill getting faster and faster trying to get good enough for heaven trying to get good enough for heaven i had a physical mental spiritual emotional meltdown in my dormitory room and I remember screaming out to God, God, I can't get good enough for heaven. I can't do this. Cross my name out of the book of life if it's even there. And it was as if Jesus whispered to me, David, you're right. You can't do this. But I can for you. And I remember taking my Bible and opening it to Jude verse 24. That little tiny book just before the book of Revelation, it only has one chapter, Jude verse 24, and this is what I read. Now to him who's able to keep you from falling. That's good news. 
because I was making a mess of walking the Christian life myself, and to present you faultless, perfect, blameless before the presence of his glory. And for the first time it hit me that I am saved not because of my perfection, but because of what Jesus has done for me, dying on Calvary's cross for me and giving me his perfect life and in the judgment saying, Father, my life stands in David's place. I was like a drowning man and I grabbed hold of Jesus Christ and his righteousness for all I'm worth. And suddenly I had this peace in my heart that I had not experienced before. Since I met Jesus, my life has changed. <laughs> It's not this laborious trying through my performance to get good enough and one day feeling like I measure up and the other day feeling like I'm never going to make it. My life now is connecting with Jesus. First thing in the morning, spending time seeing his face, hearing his reassurance. And during the day, even when I struggle, even when I mess up, Jesus is there to pick me up and I love him so very much. That's my story. I don't know how long that was, probably a little over three minutes. You may say, I don't have a story like the Hell's Angel motorcycle rider. I didn't come out of a life of drugs and crime and so forth. My story is pretty tame. Guess what? That story can have a powerful impact. Just share your story. You can share how God has been faithful in your life, how he has intervened in his life, in your life. You can share how you grew up in a Christian home and you just grew to love him more and more. And this is what Jesus means to me. And that will speak to people. Notice what Desire of Ages, page 347 says. Desire of Ages, page 347. Every individual has a life, what does it say? Distinct from all others. Your story is unique. People need to hear your unique story and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him, marked by what? Our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace when supported by a Christ-like life have what kind of power? An irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. So your story is unique. Share your unique story and it will have an irresistible power upon others. All right, let's talk about the second type of testimony. Yes, you have a story of how Jesus changed your life around three months ago, three years ago, 30 years ago. But oftentimes, people want to hear what Jesus is doing in your life right now. Here's what a daily testimony is. God's faithfulness and interventions in your daily life right now. For instance, back in August, I lost my father. My mom and dad are both gone now. And that sent me into a deep emotional tailspin. On top of the COVID and trying to teach uh, with a lot of virtual learning and so forth. And during that time, I kept claiming Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, David, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, I'm your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. So you can tell what Jesus is doing in your life right now, how he's helping you with your struggles. Also, a great way to share your daily testimony, share what you've learned in your morning devotions. Typically, when I stand up to teach in the classroom here at Southern, I will begin with a little devotional thought, just 60 seconds. Students, here's something God said to me this morning as I was reading. And I just share a little promise, 
a little insight. And students have told me over the years that those little nuggets are so meaningful to them. So we have a daily testimony to share. Here's what Testimonies Volume 6, page 64 says. The church needs what kind of experience? Fresh living experience of members who have habitual communion with God, dry, stale testimonies and prayers without the manifestation of Christ in them are no help to the people. If everyone who claims to be a child of God were filled with faith and light and light, what a wonderful witness would be given to those who come to hear the truth and how many souls might be one to Christ. So we don't want those dry, stale testimonies. <laughs> don't just share what Jesus did 30 years ago when you came to Christ. Have something fresh to share, a fresh encounter of what Jesus has done in your life today, this week. There's a third type of testimony. Not only the conversion testimony, the daily testimony, but the living testimony. Some might call it a silent witness, a silent testimony. Whether we know it or not, we are the theater of the universe. <laughs> and not only the universe, but each of you are on trial at your workplace, in your neighborhood, in the classroom, wherever you are. People are watching you. And oftentimes it's not what you say that will turn them towards Christ, it's how you live, how you live. So the living testimony can be defined as witnessing through our conduct, oftentimes without even saying a word. We won't take time to look these up, but 1 Peter 3 verse 1, in the Bible times there were a lot of women who had converted to the faith and they had unbelieving husbands. And Peter says, ladies, you can win your unbelieving husbands over without a word just by the conduct of your life. Here's another one. In the chapter before, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he says that the unbelievers are watching you and you can speak of the goodness of God just by conduct of your life, just by your good deeds, your works. Here's what Desire of Ages, page 141 says. One of the most effective ways of winning souls to him is in exemplifying his character in our daily life. Our influence upon others depends not so much upon what we say are audible, as upon what we are, that's our conduct. Men, women may combat and defy our logic. They may resist our appeals, but a life of disinterested love is an argument they cannot gainsay. A consistent life characterized by the meekness of Christ is a power in the world. So do you see, you have a story to tell. Yes, hallelujah, how Jesus became your personal savior. You can also share God's faithfulness on a day-by-day -day basis, but also perhaps one of the most powerful witnesses, the pow most powerful testimony is just living a consistent life. Johnny Barnes is known as Mr. Happy Man in Bermuda. For about 30 years up until his death in 2016, Johnny Barnes, an Adventist Christian, would wake up and go out to the roundabout in the middle of the island from about 3.45, not p.m., but a.m., till about 10 a.m., and he would just wave to the morning commute traffic. He would smile, he would toss kisses and say, I love you, I love you, in, I believe it was 1997, the business people were so impressed by his 
example that they made a bronze statue of him and put it right there at the roundabout. Johnny Barnes is no longer there. He passed away about five years ago. But what if we had Johnny Barnes's at every crossroad, at every intersection, at every roundabout, every neighborhood across the United States, across the world? People would get a positive view of what Jesus is doing in their life. I believe that our silent witness, just living a consistent Christian life, can best be seen perhaps at work. My wife works in the public school sector. Many years she taught in our Adventist school system, but uh, she's an instructional coach now in one of the local elementary schools. And sometimes she will bemoan the fact that when she goes in the teacher's lounge, all they're talking about is Friday night football or getting their nails done or the latest fashion. And she says, David, it's discouraging because I cannot overtly share my faith. The government says church, state have to be separate. But I share with her and I shared with a group of public school teachers who were Christian. I was invited by the principal to have a monthly devotional before the kids come on campus. And one morning I shared, remember the tabernacle that was ported through the wilderness on the 40 year wandering? Those heathen nations saw that Shekinah glory. They saw that light. They felt that warmth. They may not have heard a single sermon, but yes, they saw the light and felt the warmth. And I encourage them with the fact that if you invite Jesus into your heart and he is that Shekinah glory within, that no government can keep Jesus out of the classroom because he's living in your heart and he will shine out. And those kids, those teachers will see the light and feel the warmth. So that is the power of your living testimony. People will see something different about you. There's a couple ways we can exhibit this living testimony. Let's get practical. First of all, just by genuine friendship to those in your circle of influence, and then by loving service. Let's flesh this out just a tad. Chuck and Suzanne Thacker moved into Ridgetop, Tennessee back in 2005. And immediately next door were their neighbors, Dale and Myrna Smith, who happened to be the first elder and a church school teacher at the local Adventist church. They immediately came over and began to, to offer, hey, we'd love to help you move where your neighbors, welcome to the neighborhood. So they helped them unpack that moving van. They brought refreshments over. They had them over, over the months and so forth to come, over to the house for games and dinners and so forth. After a while, Chuck and Suzanne began to ask Bible questions. And Dale and Myrna happily answered with short answers from the Bible in a positive way without preaching. And after several years, Chuck and Suzanne said, we want to know what you believe. Please study with us. On the Sabbath that Chuck and Suzanne were baptized, I was there at the church to observe as ministerial director. And I remember sitting across the table from Chuck at the fellowship meal after the service. And I'll never forget what Chuck said. He said, David, moving next to Dale and Myrna Smith was the best thing that ever happened to Suzanne and I. That gets me. Folks, could people say that about you? Moving next to Supply your name is the best thing that's ever happened to us. We need to be like Jesus who mingle among men as one desiring their good. He accepted their invitations, attended their feasts, made himself familiar with their interests and occupations that he might gain access to their hearts and reveal to them the imperishable riches. Ministry of Healing 24-25. So, how well do you know your neighbors? 
we tend to hang out in the little Adventist bubble because we eat differently, we dress differently, we talk differently. I believe we need to break that mold. We need to do more socializing with those around us so they hear our story. So how do we build relational bridges? Real quick, initiate contact, go across the property line and say, hi, I'm David. This is my wife, Judy. We would love to get to know you. Where are you from? Get acquainted with FOILS. What does F-O-I-L-S stand for? What do you think? Here is what it stands for. Ask about their family. Ask about, hey, what do you do for work, their occupation? Ask about their hobbies and interests, that's the I. And then you don't ask what are the longings of your heart, but as you listen to their story, you begin to see that they have needs, cravings, longings, and then you can share a spiritual resource that will help them. I remember meeting Mary as I was getting my Subway sandwich. No one else was there. And I just asked, Mary, tell me about your family. And she began to tear up and said, my daughter lives with me, my seven-year-old. My 11-year-old Lucas, son, he lives up in Maine with his daddy and I have no visitation rights. She began to tear up and say, I'm going to go to court next month to try to earn those visitation rights. I immediately, by asking her about her family, realized she had a deep urging, urgent need for visitation rights for her son. So I said, do you mind if I pray with you that Jesus will touch the judge's heart that you might gain those visitation rights. And God answered those prayers. As you're getting acquainted, you'll discover interests, concerns, and needs. Uh, when Susan moved next to us in Portland, Tennessee, I learned from her that she had a business that went belly up in Gallatin, a photography business. I also learned that she was a single mom. She was burnt out on church and she just had a lot of loneliness, a lot of hurt in her life. So the next step is respond appropriately. I remember over the months to come, I would uh, just ask how Susan, Susan, how's your day? I remember the time she ran over a yellow jacket's nest as she was cutting her grass and I went up and filled those yellow jackets with a can of gasoline. I remember she put a water line in and it left an unsightly seam that got eroded and I put seed and straw up there and planted grass. Um, also engage in shared activities. Judy found out that Susan had an interest in health, healthful living and wanted to drop about 20 pounds. And so Judy began to walk with her and work out at the Extreme Fitness, began to share recipes. We invited Susan to church with us she wasn't ready for that. And so we had an idea. Susan, would you like to come over for Saturday lunch and then let's go walking at the local state park? So we just developed those bonds of friendship with Susan. Now, you can also exercise loving service. Loving service. I think of my friends, Daniel and Christina McFeeders, who's pictured here in this picture. They moved to McCrary County, which is the poorest county in the United States, in the eastern part of Kentucky, in the Appalachia. They did some cultural research about the best way to love their community and to serve their community. And they found out these people didn't know how to eat healthfully. They knew about eating meat, but not about fixing vegetables. So once a month, Christina had a health class, a cooking class, and featured one vegetable and how to fix that in tasty recipes. After a time, the people said, we wish you had a cafe, a restaurant here and would fix these wonderful dishes. And so she started Christina's Kitchen. That was seven years ago. And do you know over the course of those seven years, people have been touched by the love of God through this loving couple. 
in that community. Pictured here is Charlotte. Charlotte dropped about 20 pounds, and Charlotte and her kids are now attending church regularly. Sadly, the husband passed away. There's another lady by the name of Victoria who became acquainted with Adventists on Amazing Facts by watching that on television. And she started coming to the local cafeteria, uh, cafe. And Victoria is now a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because of this loving service in the community. This is what Testimonies Volume 4, page 227 says. First, meet the what? The temporal necessities. First, meet the temporal necessities before Bible studies, growth tracks, or inviting to evangelistic meetings and relieve their physical wants and sufferings. And you will then find what kind of avenue? An open avenue to the heart where you may plant the good seeds of virtue and religion. We shouldn't start with a doctrine. We should start by just telling our story, God's faithfulness in our life, and also through our consistent Christian conduct, just loving people by being a friend, by serving practical needs. Look at this diagram, and I want you to think about the various arenas in your life. Perhaps you're taking classes now. All of us, most of us have a work arena. You have a neighborhood you live in, and I heard Tom say it's by no accident that you're in that neighborhood. God has placed you there to be a light, to be salt. You shop at your favorite store, Publix or Food Lion or wherever, wherever you go. You frequent the same restaurant. You go to the same hairstylist. Think about the passage in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that sums up Christ's ministry. It says in Acts 10, 38, right in the hub, uh, the hub of those arenas, Jesus went about preaching, yes, Jesus went about giving Bible studies. Yes, he did that. But primarily, Jesus went about doing what? Doing good. I am often guilty of going about, but not necessarily intentionally touching the people in this, those various arenas of my life. So think about how you can intentionally do good to the people you go to school with, to the people you work with, the people in your neighborhood. Let me just share a couple quick synopsis of how this has worked for me. I like to go to Sam's Club to get some bulk items. And over the years, I've gotten to know Lucy with an eye. One day I was going through the checkout I had gotten my goods, I was headed out the door, and the person is there looking at your receipt, running the highlighter through to make sure you're not carrying out anything extra in your cart. Lucy exclaimed to me, guess what? This is my last day of work, I'm retiring. And I celebrated with her for a moment, and I said, Lucy, that's wonderful, congratulations. You have been so kind and all was smiling here in Sam's Club. After I went out to my car, dispensed my, my goods in the, in the uh, back of my SUV, I felt God tugging on my heart. I got an idea. I went to Walgreens, purchased a retirement card, filled out, Lucy, you have served me with excellence all these years. Thank you for your smile. Thank you for your willing spirit. May God bless you richly on your retirement. He has big plans for your life. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I came back in through the front entry of Sam's Club, 
and then came around to where Lucy was, waited for a couple customers to go by. Lucy, I've got something for you. And she read my card and teared up and said, can I give you a hug? Now this was prior to COVID. <laughs> Could I give you a hug? So there we gave a big bear hug right there in the front of Sam's Club. I like to get my car repaired at Walt's garage. Over the years, Walt has offered excellent service and I've gotten to know Walt's sidekick that sits at the front desk and takes, you know, what takes down the order of what's wrong with the vehicle. His name is Roy. I've talked with Roy over the years. We've become fairly acquainted with each other. Roy has no religious background, but one time I came in with my car for it to be repaired. Roy wasn't there. And I said, Walt, where's Roy? I miss him. He said, David, he had a stroke last week and he is at Skyline Hospital. And so, I immediately went down to Skyline and went up to the third floor, walked into Roy's room. And I said, Roy, I missed you last week when, uh, when I came by the automotive repair place. How are you doing? He could hardly speak, but he was able to choke out. David, I'm not much of a churchgoer. You're kind of my pastor. And I was able to share some promises of reassurance, a brief presentation of the gospel. And later that week, Roy passed away. I am so thankful that I was able to share with Roy before his passing. But these are just examples, folks. I believe God has divine appointments in all these arenas of your life where he wants to use you to connect with the people around you, where he wants to use your story. If God can do this in your life, help you with this struggle, help you with this challenge, give you a buoyed up spirit, even in the midst of the pandemic, then maybe God can do it for me. So let's, let's tell our story. Not only can we be engaged in loving service as individuals, but our church can engage in community outreach through a variety of things like sack lunches to homeless, uh, through a community services center, helping during times of disaster. Our Udawa church, where I'm a member, does all of these things. I believe as a church, we should assess the real needs of the community by consulting with community leaders and agencies, conducting a community survey, and there's a little resource you may or may not use in Texas Conference. It's called Mission Insight. It's a demographic resource that you can study the needs of the community right around you. Here's an example of the Chattanooga First Church here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, they did a two and a half mile radius report. There were whatever it is, let's say 5,000 people within two and a half miles of the church. And here is one of the reports that it gives. It shows the top 15 life concerns in the community right around that church in prioritized order. Amazing, it takes the guesswork out. So at the top of this list is financing the future. There's also, you see, day-to-day -day financial matters. So this church would do well to do a Dave Ramsey Financial Peace Seminar. Among the top five or so is matters of health, diet, lose eat. So find out how your community's hurting, and as a church, read out. I believe the walls yeah. of our Adventist church are too restrictive. We need to see 
our church not just as the four walls around our congregation, but extend those walls to embrace the entire community. And as we do so, this is what will happen. Testimonies, volume nine, page 189. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful, there would be what, folks? 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. Think about your local church context. This past year, 2021, did you have one baptism? Well, if we, as a committee of one, all of us as members going out sharing our story, including loving and hugging our community by friendship and service, we could have a hundred baptisms this year. If you had 10 baptisms last year, 10 times 100 is 1,000. <laughs> wow, that's what I want to see in my church, in our community. Let me just review. There are three types of testimony. You can share your conversion story, how Jesus became your personal savior. You can share your daily testimony about God's faithfulness and his intervention in your life, what he did in my life this week. And you can also share your living testimony, which even without a word, just your conduct through your genuine friendship, your loving service can touch people and let them know that Jesus loves them. What can be the results of sharing our story in these three varied ways of giving our testimony? God will bring 100 conversions where now there's only one. This picture here, my last year pastoring at Highland Academy Church in Portland, Tennessee, before I went into the office as ministerial director, we had an evangelist, Jason Sliger, come do a series of meetings and 20 people were baptized. And prior to that meeting, I urge for people to get out and just share their story. Befriend the people around you in your neighborhood, at your workplace. Exercise loving service. And 16 of the 20 people that were baptized in this picture, came because people were sharing their story in various ways. It really works. Now, if you count over the fourth person from the left, that lady with a white blouse, blonde hair, and a floral long skirt, that is my neighbor, Susan. She wasn't ready for church. She wasn't ready for a Bible study. Not at first, but over the months and over the course of three years, Susan began to ask questions. David, Judy, you have such a peace. Tell me about your faith. I notice you never cut grass on Saturday. Tell me about this Sabbath. One thing led to the next. Susan came to the evangelistic meetings and Susan made a decision to become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Folks, I believe that if we are just out telling our story, you couple that with Bible studies and evangelistic meetings, there will be folks that flock to the churches. As Ellen White said, 100 conversions, where now there is only one. I wanna close with this, Psalms 40 verses one to three. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put, what kind of song in my mouth? A new song in my mouth. Folks, that's your testimony. 
not just your conversion story that happened 30 years ago. It is a new song. It is a fresh testimony of what God has done in my life this week. He's put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And what will be the results of singing that new song and sharing that story with the people in our circle of, of influence? Here's the closing line. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Praise God. That's what sharing our testimony is all about. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, Dr. Hartman. And yes, I love how you finished there with the power of the testimony. Many will see and hear and put their trust in the Lord. We have to have that daily experience, don't we? The new song experience. And I appreciate the very practical things you said. I, I agree with you that all too often I think it's easy for us to live in a bubble where we have our own connections and our own world, our subculture, and we don't even know the neighbor next door. And uh, wh what you shared with us was practical ways we can look for opportunities and uh, say, what could I do to be a blessing to the people in my world around me? I loved your story about uh, Lucy with one eye, with an eye there uh, at... Uh, at Sam's Club and, and uh, the way that you connected with her. And I appreciate very much that. Um, Tom, I just want to ask you sure. if you have any thoughts on the presentation. And then as you're sharing that, we'll look for questions. If you have any questions, Dr. Hartman has a couple of minutes to answer some questions. Sure. If uh, you want to go on Facebook or YouTube, whatever platform you are watching us on, go ahead and put those questions in there. But David, you and I did not talk before we put our presentations together, but I believe the Holy Spirit um, worked in a mighty way to take what we talked about, what he put on our hearts, and br bring it together in such a practical way. Um, so thank you for that. That is something that, that I love, just how you made it so practical in the sense that I need to be aware of God's working in my community and how I get to interface with that whether it be at Waltz, whether it be at Sam's Clubs, whether it be um, at our restaurant, whatever that, I love that intentionality of looking for those places where you can create those relationships and then be able to tell your story and to be able to show through your life um, through kindness. So thank you for, for that. that. That for me was absolutely amazing to see how both of our, our talks dovetailed. Amen. Thank you. They really did dovetail. I was worried there'd be too much overlap, but hey, God is in the details. Uh, let me add one quick thing. I know questions may be coming in, but I didn't share this. Every morning of my life, I grab this little mug. It's got a dove on it. There's a long story behind it, but I, I just pray this little prayer. Lord, flush me of self. <clears throat> fill me with you. And empower me to share you with at least one person today. And Amen. God never, God never fails. <laughs> It always happens at you know, inopportune times or whatever. Yeah, as you're sharing that, you're leading right into what I was going to um, talk about because I liked the idea of looking for opportunities to share and what Tom shared about intentionality. Um, you know, I, I don't remember where. I read it in the, Col the book Cole Porter Ministry somewhere. When I was Cole Portering, I would read from that every morning before I'd go out to start my day. And um, somewhere there it says that when we when we take the opportunity to softly and reverently mention the name of Jesus to someone as we're introducing them to an opportunity to meet Jesus, it says that angels press close to soften that heart and prepare them. And I started thinking about how the angels would love to have the opportunities that we have to share Jesus, but their assignment from heaven is to assist us, which means if I'm not doing anything, they're kind of like, you know, like I, I see them like they're chomping at the bit as a, a racehorse ready to go. Like, let's get up today, do something today to share Jesus with somebody. So being intentional is an opportunity that we all have. And one of the ways that played out for me was recently I have this um, young man who cuts my hair here. He went to school at the local academy and graduated with my son. And I said, man, I love your haircuts. 
But one time when you were out of town and I needed a haircut, I went to a local stylist and God impressed me that I need to connect with this lady. So no offense to you, I'm going to start paying more for my haircut so I can keep going to her and connect with her. And through that intentional opportunity, I now have an opportunity to have Bible studies with her and uh, share Jesus with her. So, so you, can, you can do that by asking God to give you those opportunities and then looking for them. We, we've got a great question, David. I know, it's, it's, I know, know you're going to answer it wonderfully. It's, how do you share Jesus with people who are very critical and negative? Kenneth Caesar asked that. How do you share Jesus with people who are very critical and negative? Mm. Well, I think behind the criticalness and negativity, there's a story. And uh, I, I think just listening to people, maybe through acts of kindness, uh, befriend them. And, hey, John, Jerry, uh, tell, me, tell me your story. Tell me what's happening in your life. And maybe you can discern some reasons why they're so critical and negative. But uh, certainly, you, you can't preach at them, hey, stop being negative. I think just through practical acts of kindness, that's going to break down the negativity, the criticism, uh, where they will be receptive. Honestly, Susan, she was pretty critical and negative towards Christianity. And we just mm -hmm. showered her in practical ways, and she began asking questions. So, yeah. I, I love what you shared about the, the FOILs, the acronym, how people enjoy talking about themselves. The minute you ask about family, all of a sudden they, they open up to, hey, let me tell you about my wife, my kids, they did this, they did this. Especially if you're a grandparent, they, you, that opens up doors. And so I love that practical aspect of just asking about them. Yeah, we think to be good witnesses, we got to do the talking. Man, the best kind of witness is just to listen to people, and that's yeah. a real ministry. Amen. I agree. Well, we can hear um, the hurts of their heart as we listen, and then we can share a spiritual resource that has helped us. We can share our testimony. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartman. I wish we had more time, but what you've shared has been so valuable, so rich with uh, resources and things for us to consider and put into practical use. Um, we want to just uh, thank you for the time that you've given. We pray God's blessing on you and your loved ones. And we're going to have to wrap this section up so that we can leave enough time for our next guest. And uh, again, blessings on you. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment with our next guest, Sam Nevis. Mm -hmm.